Hey guys, this is Comic Uno, and today I'm doing Comic Uno episode 251, and this is a show where I review all the comics I've read this week in one show. We go least favorite to pick of the week, so let's get started. So I actually had a kind of light week this week. It seemed like a lot of people did. Uh, I actually picked up like an extra book or two because of it. Uh, but number 15 for me this week, 15 books, uh, was Hunt for Wolverine Weapons Lost issue 4. Didn't like last week's book and I, I didn't like this week's book either. I just don't see the point of, of these miniseries. Uh, I like the first issue of, of most of them but as we get along I I don't know if we needed these miniseries. I think we could have just had the one one shot and now the last one shot which is actually gonna give us the answers for Wolverine. I feel like uh, we didn't really get to even see their relationships with Wolverine. It was more about the hunt but you never see Wolverine so it's not as interesting and I think this one especially is so far uh, from Wolverine. They really tried to connect Daredevil and Wolverine because Charles Soule writes Daredevil, so I felt like the connection uh, was a little bit too loose there. So Weapon Lost Issue 4 gets two stars, and that is my number 15 pick. Now moving on to number 14, which is Deathstroke Issue 34. Uh, reason this is a bit higher, I, I like the artwork. I mean, the action's really good, especially for this versus uh, story arc that's been going on for way too, uh, way too long. Uh, but I'm just not interested in this story. It haven't been since the beginning uh, with this, oh, is Deathstroke Davian's dad? I don't, I'm not interested in it. I'm not invested. Uh, so I'm waiting for this arc to be over, uh, and, and that's it. So uh, Deathstroke, issue 34, gets two stars for me, and that is number 14. Moving on to number 13, which is Astonishing X-Men, issue 14. Uh, was a bit torn with this issue because there's a lot of things I like about it. I, I do like that it's kind of the, the misfit X-Men trying to make an X-Men team, can't even call themselves the X-Men. Uh, but I feel like some voices feel a little off to me, like Dazzler. Uh, there's aspects I like about her, you know, her nostalgia career or, or her tour is really interesting. But anytime she talks, I feel like she's trying uh, to one-up everybody, and that never really felt like Dazzler to me. So I wasn't a big fan of her voice in this issue. Uh, but I like the direction it's going. Another reason this is a little lower, Greg Land's artwork. And, and one thing I've realized about Land's artwork, gorgeous covers. This is my favorite cover of the week. But then uh, his interiors, the, the facial expressions are just way too much sometimes. I didn't really like Dazzler's new look with the, the brown hair uh, and then she had to wear a wig. I didn't really get why they had to do that. Uh, yeah, the smiles are just over-exaggerated. Um, I did like glasses a lot in this issue. I liked that they, they referenced a wedding. I thought that was good and, and where, she, where he's been at. So... Yeah, again, torn, because there's def definitely some good stuff in here, and I'll, I'll obviously continue to read it, but hopefully the artist changes soon. I don't think it fits for this book, and I think Lan should stick to, to cover art. So uh, I'm going to give this one three stars, and that is number 13, I believe. Moving on to number 12, another X-Men book, which is X-Men Gold, issue 33. Uh, not bad. I'm not a huge Storm fan, so I wasn't as invested in her story here, especially that Thor story going on. I, I don't really get that. Uh, the Rachel stuff is a little slow. It's her dealing with that last arc of her, uh, you know, being controlled and not knowing why, and, and maybe the X-Men not trusting her because of it, or feeling like the X-Men uh, don't trust her. Uh, it's definitely a slower issue here, a lot set up for Storm Story and slow aftermath of Rachel, but I thought the artwork was really solid uh, across the board. I will say I think Rachel and Kitty end up looking the same at some points, where I'm like, wait, is this Kitty? Is this Rachel? Especially here, because this looks more like brown hair than red hair. So the coloring was a little off at times, but uh, other than that, I, I thought the facial expressions were solid uh, across the board. Just kind of wish Rachel and Kitty looked a, a little bit more different here. Uh, so I'm going to give that one three stars. Moving on to number 11, which I did an in-depth review on, and that is Infinity Wars issue 1. And I wasn't going to originally pick up this book. I didn't really read the prelude. I read like one issue of it, wasn't into it. But because it was such a light week and I found out what happened last week with Thanos, I'm like, oh, you know, things are picking up a bit. Let me uh, try this out. Like I said, light week. Uh, it's 
a little lower because A, I'm not a big fan of Cosmic Marvel in general, so uh, this is not my fandom by any means. And I think it focuses way too much on the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, because Dugan wrote Guardians of the Galaxy and this feels like more of a continuation of that series uh, than anything. Uh, and also, you know, the price tag, that's the big thing. Six dollars for this book. I think they could have thinned it a bit more to get to maybe a four ninety nine price tag. Would would have been a little bit more reasonable. But where the story really picks up is uh, when we find out who this new villain is. And uh, spoiler alert: it is uh, Gamora, and and we get to see her possibly kill Peter. But the way she says it, it doesn't really sound like she did. So uh, definitely got me curious to, to at least want to pick up the next issue. So uh, another thing I will say about the artwork, though, I actually really like the pencils, but I feel like the coloring is just way too dark and muddy. And, and that's the one thing I've never liked about the Dotto's artwork. Either I don't know if he does the coloring or it's just the colorist he usually partners up with. Just is always very bogged down the coloring, uh, which makes me uh, enjoy the pencils less. Uh, so Infinity Wars issue one gets three stars. Uh, if you want more of an in-depth review for that, like I said, I, I did do an individual review. So that's number 11. Moving on to number 10, uh, which is in the middle. Usually it's a little higher, but in Justice 2, issue 31, uh, it's more of an action issue and, and kind of placing pieces on the board. We get to see Hal get his Green Lantern ring back. Definitely the best moment of this issue being Lobo getting his Green Lantern ring. I thought that was a really cool ending. But uh, the reason this is higher than some of the other books, the artwork is gorgeous. Uh, some of the best artwork, I think, from DC and in comics right now is in Injustice. The facial expressions are just so good. Uh, and you get so much emotion here. The coloring is crisp. I, I really like the, the artwork here. Uh, but again, this is mostly an action issue, placing the pieces on the board uh, to continue the story. So I gave this one three and a half stars. I want a little bit more character moments uh, like I'm used to with Injustice. So uh, like I said, three and a half stars. Moving on to number nine, which is Frozen, issue one. Uh, I've been picking up uh, most of the Disney books over at Dark Horse, because I'm a huge Disney fan, if you don't know that. Uh, and this one I actually was pleasantly surprised by. I read uh, the previous Frozen book, which I don't, I think it was Joe Books who released it. And it was more short stories, and they were so fillerish. And uh, I understood why, because obviously Frozen 2 hasn't come out yet. We don't know what that story is going to be. So you don't want to step on any toes. And also, it's a kid book, so you don't really need to put any real plot into it. Uh, you could just have fun adventures with Anna and Elsa. But here I really like the issue because we actually do have a forward story here, a real plot where this girl from another town, a mysterious girl, uh, you know, ends up in Elsa and Anna's village and uh, she runs away. We don't really know why. And we learn a little bit about her family. Uh, and Anna's trying to find a pl uh, her place in, in the town because she's not queen. So what does she do? What's her role? What's her job? So I enjoyed that aspect. Um, I wanted a little bit more from the sisters as characters. Uh, that would definitely be a small complaint of the book, but I thought it was a good start for the first issue. Uh, overall, I liked the artwork. I actually expected it to be a little more cartoonier than it was. Like, uh, the expressions, I, I wanted a little bit more from, especially the, the mouth, the, the facial expressions. I, I wanted a little bit more energy because it is an all-ages book and it's Frozen and Disney. But uh, overall, like I said, three and a half stars. I was impressed with this book and got more than I expected with this one. And I think it uh, will learn a little bit more about itself as the series goes on. Definitely we'll be picking more of that up. So that's number nine. Moving on to number eight, which is Ant-Man and the Wasp issue four. Uh, this has probably been the highest that this series has been. Uh, I thought this had a lot more story than what we've been getting. And we get to see Nadia and Scott thinking they're back on Earth and Nadia just trying to figure out, hey, what ended up happening in, in the quantum realm. And then Scott goes visits his daughter. He realizes something's up. Why does everyone love me? Something's up with my daughter. Like, what's going on? And they realize they're actually not on Earth. And I thought it was cool the, the way they played with that, especially Nadia just trying to impress her father because she sees Hank. That's the real clue that this is not Earth. And she's like, oh my God, Dad, you know, this is what I've been doing. This is, you know, let me catch you up. And Scott's like, you don't have to impress your dad. That's that's, that's not, you know, what your relationship has to be. And I really like that moment. And I think finally you get to see these two truly connect and you want to see more from them. Kind of wish this moment was a little earlier in the series. Um, also, I like the artwork overall, at least for the, the 
world building I really like, but I didn't love Scott's facial features. Uh, the five o'clock shadow didn't really quite work for him. I, I don't know. It just kind of looked weird, his face in, in this issue, but I liked the surroundingness of the artwork. Uh, so overall, I gave this three and a half stars. Definitely interested to see how it will conclude, and I thought this was one of the better issues. Moving on to number seven, I believe we're up to. Yes, we're up to number seven, which is Immortal Hulk, issue four. I got this digitally because I forgot it was coming out this month. I don't, I, well, this week, uh, because it just came out, I felt like. I mean, it's every two weeks, but I didn't see it on my list, and that rarely happens, and I saw it on um, Comic Book Roundup. Usually, I like looking at the, the ratings after I read a book, or read my books to see what people thought, um, and I was like, oh my god, Immortal Hulk came out. So, uh, yeah, Mortal Hulk came out, and this is a lot better, this issue, than last. Last issue was kind of weird, filler, definitely did not fit for a beginning of a series issue. And then this one, we get to see uh, Bruce's college roommate, and, you know, he's been affected by the gamma rays, and uh, it connects to this whole death scenario going on with Immortal Hulk and how he survived and, and what this means about the Hulk and, and you definitely get the horror feel that I really liked about this series so I thought this was much more of an uh, improvement. I wanted more Bruce in this issue but definitely a step in in the right direction and the artwork is so good it's haunting uh, but it's not too dark where you're like okay this is just totally a horror book. It feels like a classic Marvel horror story so I enjoyed that. So uh, that's number seven, and I gave that three and a half stars. Moving on to number six, which is Batman issue 52. Uh, I thought the last issue was a little bit better. I, I expected at least the people to be swayed by Batman a little bit more here, but it's really just Batman trying to explain this is why we should look at the case further. And, you know, he gets to learn a little bit more about the other people. Um, but you never get a moment where the other people are like, Bruce, you might be right. I think I would be more convinced if at least one person said, hey, okay, like, Bruce, let's, I, I totally agree with you, or something. I, I don't know. But I, I felt like this was a slower issue than it had to be. Um, but I love the artwork. I, I really love the anger that we get to see from Bruce. I like the transitions. So overall, I'm going to give this one three and a half stars. And that was number six. Moving on to number five. Uh, which is a new series. This was another series that I on kind of when picked up because it was a small week, and that is The Seeds, issue one. Uh, big fan of David Aja. I, I, I like Hawkeye a lot. I, I liked his run, so I was looking forward to this book, uh, and I, I didn't really know much about it. I just knew it was going to be a political journalism style uh, story, and I liked what it had to say. I will say that I think it, it was trying to say a little bit too much. You have the wall, you have environmental stuff, so it was a lot of topics at once. But it was important topics, and I liked the way they uh, were, were saying it. You know, I enjoyed that aspect. I liked that our main character um, is a journalist and actually wants to tell true stories. This goes into the more political stuff that, uh, you know, fake news. She goes to her editor and she wants to tell a certain story. She's like, no, you gotta tell this story and if you have to make it up, make it up. It's just like the aliens, you know, she tells kind of this history lesson. And then what really hooked me and why this is in my top five was the cliffhanger where she realizes aliens are real. So that wasn't even a fake story. So uh, in her mind, it's like, oh, does fake news exist in her in her uh, in her head? So I thought that was cool. I thought that was kind of a cool twist in the end. And I don't know what this world's all about, but that's kind of what makes it interesting. Um, I love the green coloring. I really think Aja um, brings a really nice uh, deep tone to the book. I or emotional tone, I guess. Uh, I like it. I thought it was solid. Definitely will pick up the next issue. And if you like political books, get it. If you don't. This probably is not the book for you, but uh, I give this one four stars. Moving on to number four, which is just fun, fun nostalgia, and that's X-Men Gold issue two annual. Uh, I'm a huge Kitty Pry fan, if you guys don't know, <laughs> I am. Uh, and, you know, this reminded me of, like, really old school Kitty Pride, like the, the fairy tales issue. It kind of reminded me of that, uh, but a little bit more serious, where Kitty uh, goes to summer camp to kind of to try to feel normal, and she realizes that people are bigots and uh, they are against mutants, which uh, is something in, in X-Men that I feel I, I wish not 
everybody was a bigot yeah, that's who's not a who's not a mutant i think that's something that x-men could do better at at saying oh yeah well not everyone's against mutants but i understand the political aspect why they end up doing it um but uh in this issue it's kind of standard x-men everyone in this camp are bigots except the mutants and uh, i did like this love in uh, this love interest thing though uh which i thought was ended up happening in the end a little too quickly but i liked what it meant uh, where we get to see this guy who's also a mutant and thinks that Kitty is a bigot just because of the people she hangs out with. And he's like, no, you know, I'm a mutant too. And they end up kissing and she, he's kind of disgusted by it. And he's like, no, you know, we we can't further this. We can't further the mutant gene. You know, we end up um, having a kid, which he's definitely overthinking things. He's like, oh, if we have a kid. Um, uh, he's definitely rushing things, but... If they do, then uh, they'll definitely have a kid who's a mutant, at least in his mind. So uh, he, it's interesting because he also has like these these kind of elf ears. So he has a harder time hiding hiding his mutant gene, and he wants to hide it. So uh, that's always been interesting about Kitty's uh, character as well is that she's somebody who could easily um, not you know, uh, you know, she could hide being a mutant, but she doesn't, and because she's proud of it, and she's proud of being a mutant, which, you know, she should be proud of it, and she's always, you know, fighting for, for people, that's what the X-Men are for, you know, fighting for equality, so, uh, and, and you really get to see that in the forefront here with her, you know, love interest, and, and just trying to be normal, but realizing, you know, normal's overrated, uh, so I think it really hits on a lot of earlier themes with Kitty, and why people love her character and, and still do love her character and, and why she's an important character uh, so I really like that I think there's some aspects that feel a little rushed and you know tropes that uh, I'm kind of tired of with the X-Men again like everyone has to be a, a bigot for uh, for mutants and that I felt like the the friends uh, you know Kitty forgave her friends a little bit too easily uh, I think if they found out she was a mutant and didn't care that would have been an easier uh, way to say okay now I can understand why Kitty would forgive them for, you know, being bigots. Uh, and then, in the love interest, I do think it was a little... I wish that he was established earlier in the issue. That way, it, it weaved in a little bit better. But overall, it's a really solid issue. Uh, I like the art style. Kind of reminds me of Joe Eisma's art style from Morning Glories, and he's been working on some Archie stuff now. Uh, and I like his style a lot. Uh, there's some places that feel a little rushed. That, that would be my uh, small nitpick. Uh, but like I said, I, I enjoyed this one. If you're a Kitty fan uh, or just 80s X-Men fan, uh, I recommend this one. So uh, I gave that one four stars. So moving on to number three, which is Go Go Power Rangers issue 12. Now this is really hard because I loved Go Go Power Rangers and I loved all three of these books. Uh, so it was really hard to rank all these. These are all four and a half star books for me. So, but Go Go Power Rangers was really good this week uh, and... What I really enjoyed, and something I've been waiting for, is uh, for Matt to find out that uh, the Power Rangers are, his best friends are the Power Rangers, and he finds out in a, in a sneaky way, he finds out with Ranger Slayer Kim, because she's the only one who can tell him, uh, and she says, hey, you know, I've been hiding this forever, and I, this is something I've always regret regretted, I am, you know, a Power Ranger, and, and it's kind of off screen where, where she says it, or off panel, and then Matt says, straight up to his friends, like, just tell me, you know, like, I won't get mad, like, just, just tell me, and they don't say anything, and that's when he gets mad, because they can't say anything, so I thought that was a really interesting ending, and I'm looking forward to see where that goes post-Shattered Grid. Uh, other stuff I really like, I mean, the action was really good, too, I mean, I love, uh, Kim's, uh, fight with, uh, with Tommy, where she's able to go back, and, and she's ready to kill him, but she doesn't. She doesn't kill him. And I thought that was a really uh, good move, you know, that she doesn't go all vendetta. Um, she actually just tries to help him not to become Lord Draken. So we'll see how that plays out in Mighty Morphin and if it ends up doing anything. Uh, so I love Ranger Slayer, uh, Ranger Slayer Kim, though. I just love her character. Uh, I, and my only nitpick worthy issue is probably, um, which is a really good scene, but didn't fit for me in this issue, uh, was Jason's uh, father. Um, it's like one page, I think, so it's just obviously a really small nitpick. Um, it's just that Jason's talking to his father, and he's saying, oh, we have to talk about this, and it just felt like it didn't fit this issue. Maybe that would have been better post-Shattered Grid, which I'm sure they're going to deal with it post-Shattered Grid, uh, but maybe because Jason just didn't have as much, so that's why it was added. But uh, overall, I love the artwork. There's some really good... Uh, 
action between the Zords, especially Ranger Slayer's uh, Zord. Uh, some really good stuff in this one. And also you get a nice cliffhanger with Ranger Slayer Kim where Grace comes up to her. So we'll see if that's going to play out in Shattered Grid or obviously the new creative team is going to have Ranger Slayer Kim be the leader of that team. So is Grace going to be involved in that? We'll have to see. Um, which I've actually been surprised that Grace hasn't been utilized in Shattered Grid as much as I expected. So maybe post Shattered Grid we're going to see a little bit more of her. So Overall, I gave this four and a half stars. Like I said, really enjoyed this issue and can't wait to see where this series ends up going and obviously where Shattered Grid ends up going. So that's my number three. And I love this cover too. More Ranger Slayer Kim. Give it to me. <laughs> I love her. Uh, all right, moving on to number two, which is uh, Mr. Miracle, issue 10. Uh, this was probably one of my favorite Mr. Miracle issues. Uh, I just love how mundane it is, and that's kind of what I, I love about it, and it's still entertaining. You know, there's moments where uh, Mr. Miracle is, tr you know, Scott is trying to buy a birthday thing for his son, and is just using the chip. And there's that awesome beat where he just has to wait. He's like, give it a, mo give it a moment. We've all been there. Uh, so it's you know, that's the best part about this uh, this comic, is that these are gods. These are people fighting wars about being gods. But then you have these small moments of planning a birthday party or putting the chip in uh, the credit card machine. And, and you get so many great moments like that. You get to see Mr. Miracle get drunk with his friends. You get to see him have marriage issues. And I really like how they tackle depression here. Uh, you know, it's been something that's been tackled in almost every issue, but now it is Barda fully saying, is it because of me? And I think, you know, how loved ones can't handle depression um, was showcased really interestingly here and, and it just was a really emotional great scene and then there's just a ton of meta stuff in this one too like uh, the whole team saying oh what's gonna be next red gold blue I feel like it was a little dig at X-Men and then you have uh, if you know anything about Tom King he always does these like bad drawings of like Batman anytime he signs anything and you have like this whole entire page of that let me see if I can find it of uh of his son creating a story. You even have the Sheriff of Babylon t-shirt. It's, you know, there's so many meta aspects to it too, but it's so grounded. And the small beats that we kind of take advantage of and that make it so realistic uh, is what makes the series. It's the mundane <laughs> that makes the series so much fun. And I, I kind of wish more series had time to do that, uh, to really show kind of the awkwardness of life sometimes. And I think that Mr. Miracle does a really good job at that. Uh, so overall, I gave this one four and a half stars, and that is number two. Moving on to number one, you guessed it, guys. Paper Girls, issue 23. I, I love this series. It's my favorite series out there. Uh, so uh, yeah, had to talk about this one, and I'm so glad it's my number one. Uh, and we get to see a little bit more about this world. We get to see that woman who was like hiding those uh, uh, objects and, and trying to sell them. And uh, she interacts with the two Tiffany's and Erin, uh, so we, we get to see a little, learn a little bit more about Wari, and, and they end up interacting, so it leads them to the villains, and they don't even know it. So that was cool. Uh, but the thing I really, really enjoyed about this issue, it was Mac and KJ. So KJ um, is really worried about this future message, and Mac's like, oh, I don't really want to, you know, talk about it. It's, it's just probably your imagination. No one else heard it. And I love that KJ guessed what I guessed last month, where KJ's like, well, you know, if someone was dying next to you, it probably was me. Uh, so she's worried about it, and Mac's like, well, if anyone's gonna die, it's, it's gonna be me, the one who's gonna have leukemia. Uh, and, was, and then Mac brings up the vision, and KJ finally reveals uh, what she saw in the vision, and I love the way she says it. It's it's awkward, and I, and I love it, and it's exactly the way KJ would say something. I just said we were romantic. <laughs> uh, and Matt's like, what? And she is in denial. And I really like how they show denial here. And she's like, that's disgusting, you know. Uh, and she pushes KJ. Uh, and there's a moment where she says, um, if you want to grow up to be a pervert, I can't stop you. But it's got jack to do with me. Get it? And then KJ's like, yeah, got it, I guess. You know, uh, so it's just the way KJ reacts to it. It's just such a good scene. And I, I can't wait to see where their relationship ends up going. Uh, and then we get, uh, finally, Mac and KJ find the doctor that can help Mac. Uh, 
Uh, and then Mac does not have the insurance ship. She's like, oh, I can't help you. Uh, and then KJ, uh, we finally get to see a little bit more from what we saw in last arc where KJ killed somebody. And she's willing to kill again. She's like, I've killed somebody and I don't have a problem killing you to, to get what we need. So, uh, and then Mac's just like, whoa, that's badass. So is, is Mac starting to fall in love with KJ because uh, she's, you know, trying to help Mac out and, and seeing that, oh, this is a side of you I haven't seen and, and, you know, starting to have a crush on KJ, which is, you know, we're going to probably get the kiss very soon because it's in this... Um, this time period. So um, I really like that and I, and I can't wait to see where their the relationship ends up going. The artwork is so good. Again, the emotions that Cliff Chang draws here is is beautiful. And then we also get what you love about Paper Girls, kind of a weird technology and monsters and, and you know, it's so creative, this book. So I really enjoyed it. There's a lot of scenes I was just like, oh my god, what's gonna be my panel of the week this week? I don't know, because there are just so many great small scenes in this one uh, that makes Paper Girls for me. So overall, I gave this one four and a half stars. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic You Know. Let me know in the comments below what was, what was your least favorite, what was your pick of the week, and everything in between. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. This is Comic You Know. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to like my Facebook page. Also, description below, there are links for my comic book, Like Father, Like Daughter. And don't forget to like the Facebook page of Like Father, Like Daughter. I'll see you guys later.